Okay, I'm just going to do a quick tutorial on how to answer dilemma board questions in case any of you feel that you haven't um, or aren't in a position to do that properly before the uh, pre public exam in January. Um, on the screen, there's an example of a dilemma board question. Um, just take a minute to read it and pause this presentation and give it a read. You'll see that the question is asking you to evaluate the accuracy of each of the four statements A, B, C and D individually as they apply to the facts in the scenario. Um, so when we do dilemma board questions, you, you'll, you'll have 20 minutes to do these, most students leave them to the end of the exam, you'll have four statements to evaluate, what you need to do is read that scenario very very carefully, um, work out what the issues are and each one that you evaluate you focus on that statement only and only what that statement says, don't bring in anything from outside. Um, that's not relevant to the to the accuracy or otherwise of that sentence. You don't need to include cases, although sometimes throwing the odd one in is helpful to kind of help you reason uh, and think your way through the problem. And at the end, you've got to remember after uh, at the end of each sort of five mark section to state whether you think the statement is accurate or not. Um, so those are sort of some of the key things really to getting dilemma board questions. Um, so our technique for dilemma board questions is we always start by st a statement of the legal principle. For example, um, the presumption in social and domestic cases that um, there's no legal intent or something like that. Okay. You would then look at any exceptions or qualifications to that rule. Um, so, for example, in the one I've just given, that would be something uh, along the lines of unless there's um, evidence uh, to help the court rebut that presumption. Um, you then apply it to the scenario. So you say, in this case... I think that it is a social domestic agreement or it's not and that there is or is not an exception. Um, you then draw a conclusion by saying, well, therefore, there's a legally binding contract or not or whatever the appropriate conclusion is. And then at the end, it's important, like I said, to remember to say whether the statement is accurate or not. OK, so if we have a look at this one that we had on the screen at the start, um, Bob is the manager of a sports stadium hosting a professional football game. He is worried about crowd problems and the local police agree to station extra police officers outside the stadium. After the match, Bob promises to pay the police for the, the extra work that they did. Bob also promises to pay his staff a bonus because they work very hard. When Bob gets home, he promises to cook his wife, Megan, her favourite meal if she stops complaining about him working so hard. So there's obviously sort of three different um, situations in there. There's one with the police, one with the staff and one with Megan. Um, and as you can see, the question says evaluate the accuracy of each of the four statements, A, B, C and D individually, as they apply to the facts in the above scenario. So we're going to, we're going to look at um, statement A to start with when we're doing this. So statement A, Bob's promise to the police is unenforceable because their consideration is past. So when you're answering this one, you're going to focus solely on the issue of past consideration. And like we said, you're going to start by stating the relevant principle. So the first thing, so the first thing we would say for this one would be to state the, the relevant principle, and that is that past consideration is not, generally speaking, good consideration. I mean, you don't need to put a case in, but you could put Rima card in or something. And, um, then you go for the qualification or any extra kind of things to think about. So in this case, we know that past consideration can be good consideration if an act is done at the request of the promiser and payment is implied all along. I should have the word payment in there on number two, by the way. Um, okay, so that, that would be your sort of qualifying statement. Then you need to apply it to the scenario. So then number three, you'd say something like, the police carry out the extra work at Bob's request. So in other words, guys, at the, re at the request of the promiser. And payment will be implied where extra offices are provided at sporting events. By the way, I do know how to spell officers. It's just a typo. Okay, so now what we've done is we've stated a principle and an exception. We've applied it to the scenario. We now need to draw a conclusion. And our conclusion would be that, therefore, there is good consideration in this case. And Bob's promise is enforceable. So it's a bit like, you know, Lampley v. Braithwaite or Casey's Patents. Um, but don't forget, the last thing we've got to do to get full marks is to then tell the examiner whether the statement is accurate or not. So that's our last thing. So number five would be, therefore, the statement is inaccurate. And that's how you answer a, a, a dilemma board question. If you've got any questions about that or you're not sure, um, please feel free to email me, ahowells at loretto.ac.uk. Um, also, we've put some past papers on email to you, so if you want to have a go at any, send them to me, whichever group you're from, mine or Miss Follums, and I'm quite happy to mark them um, and send them back to you. Okay, um, thanks very much.